as the writing on the little plaque that was given to the fathers is really the four landmarks that we want to address today in our message. A message to fathers, of course, is not a message to fathers, which means that mothers can tune out. Uh, we just want you to support us. As you know, last month we had Mother's Day, and this month we have Father's Day. So every now and then we have a service where it's dedicated to one of the sexes, and, and it doesn't mean that we ignore the other, it just means we highlight the one. How about that? Amen. Um, father, and I will spend a lot more time on this a little bit later in the message, but uh, in the Bible, in the New Testament, there are three occasions where there was a special attention to the word used for father when translated to English, or when transliterated to English, we say Abba which some people try to encourage us to think of it as daddy. I think it's a lot deeper than daddy, but it's okay. It's showing a personal relationship between the individual who's speaking and the person to whom or of whom they are speaking. And, and usually they do not use the word Abba, but in the New Testament three times, the word Abba was used. And we also know that in Hebrew, and so it's transliteration because it's really a Hebrew word that's being borrowed by Aramaic when they say Abba. It's, it's a Hebrew word, but it, in the New Testament, you know it's Greek, so the Greeks quoted the, the Hebrew word Abba on those three occasions. Uh, one of which is Jesus speaking. And then there's a symbol because the Greeks, the Old Testament Greek wrote in symbols. Uh, and, and if you look at Greek, it doesn't use our alpha, uh, so therefore it doesn't look like any of our letters. And the symbol for father is uh, upside down V. And that symbol represents the same as the word for house. So in the Old Testament idea of conveying who a father was, a father was a symbol of a place where you can run to and be safe. It's the symbol of a person who will cover you. That's why the upside down V. It's a symbol of a relationship that covers you, that protects you, that even provides for you. And so we know that the term father existed from the beginning of time. We know that in the very beginning, when God says in the beginning, God, he is speaking of all three expressions that we've come to know of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So Father is one who cares for, protects, or guides. In Genesis chapter 22, you know the story of, of uh, Abraham, who is being led by the Holy Spirit to go and make a sacrifice to God. And as the story goes, he took his son and a, a, a whole entourage of people with him. When they got to the bottom of the mountain, he says a prophetic word that we only know it to, to be prophetic after the fact. He said to the people, wait here. Me and the boy, we're going up to offer sacrifice and we will be back. Now that's prophetic because if you read before that, Abraham knows that his duty is to offer his son Isaac a sacrifice. 
sacrifice. Yet at the bottom of the mountain, he tells the rest of his entourage, we, the boy and I, will be back. Wait here for us. Such, such a noble understanding of God's word and belief in God's power, Abraham knew and believed that if this God was able to do all that he was able to do for him, if this God has said to me that you will have a son, and through this son you will have all nations, and I went astray and listened to my crazy wife and started another son, and it didn't work out. <laughs> so Lord, I thank you for forgiving me. See, God is so wonderful that even when we mess up, when we go astray and take things into our own hands based on our own understanding, when we listen to someone that we know isn't listening to God, but we take Hagar and decide that, well, I want to please my wife, a happy wife with a happy life, so if she tells me to go with Hagar and get her a son, who am I? And the price that they have paid for this is a price that's being paid to this day because the descendants of Hagar, the Iranians, are still today fighting the descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people. To so this day, Iran hates Israel. And forever, there will be a fight between the two because you didn't follow what God said. But in this moment in time, Genesis 22, God has given him a restoration moment. God has given him a blessing. God said, this is the son that I was promising you all along. Because your wife is now old and she can't bear children and she laughed at me when I said she was going to have children. But here's your son. This is the one through whom you will be blessed and the stars, if you can count them, you'll be off but the number of stars will not match the number of your descendants. The number of grains of sand on the, on the shore will not match your descendants. I'm going to make you the father of all nations. So if God says, I'm going to make you the father of all nations, the God who was able to do the impossible, I don't know, Sister Reed, you're 90, 91? You ready to have a son? <laughs> I don't think so. Because Sarah was approaching your age when she had a son. Can you imagine that? If God can do the impossible and give me a son from my wife way beyond her childbearing years, then this God must be able, if I was sacrifice this son to him, he must be able to return it to me. Yes, yes. See, that's faith in action. Yes, yes. That's not somebody who says, I believe, but it's somebody who's showing you that he believes. Yes. This is what a father is supposed to do for his children. Set a standard by which his children can stand up before God. Because if my father has done it, then I'm blessed because the father the blessings of the father fall to the third and the fourth generation. Yes. What, what we are missing today is fathers. And it's not always the father's fault. In the 1980s, the women wanted to be so equal to men that they just wanted baby daddies. And so in the 80s, we, we moved away the responsibility of fatherhood and relegated it to nobody. Any guy in the hood would do, because I just want to be. And as a result, today, all of these kids are now in their 20s and 30s, and they're there without fathers. Mothers, you were wrong to think that you could elect to raise your sons without fathers. And we're paying the price for that today because most of the black kids 
most of the people who involved in that were black, so most of the kids that were born were black, and most of the population of our jails are black. And most of them were born in the 80s. Yeah. See the price that we were paying when you don't follow what God says? Yeah. Yeah. God has established fatherhood to protect, to provide, to be the example so that these young boys will have someone to whom to look up. So that they can be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So that they can be brought up as children in this version that says in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so when we have relegated that to women who are decided, not women whose husbands died or things went bad, but women who decided, I don't even want a man in my life. Now we're paying the price. Now I'm not blaming the women. Man, you can't escape. You know, you like that Hagar moment where you don't have to be responsible. You just could go off and get a son for your wife. God didn't tell you to do that. God didn't tell the man to do this. So I'm not saying, man, you are, you are excused at all. But God wants fathers to be men who will stand up to show that they are an example before their children. Our children today, you look around at the children today who have had a father present in their lives, all of their lives, and you compare that to the children today who didn't have a father in their lives, and you will see a marked difference. You will see ones who are going to college. You will see ones who are graduating from college and getting married. You will see ones who are, are family oriented. Not everyone works so perfectly, but everyone can see the difference between children who were brought up in the nuclear family that God has created versus children who were brought up by single parents. Yeah. I don't need to cite statistics. All you're going to do is open your eyes. All you're going to do is to have lived long enough to see that there's a marked difference. Yeah. Yes. Now, yes, there's a whole lot of cases. We, we, we hear of, uh, oh, now his name just eluded me. He's now the head of housing. The disappointed black man that I used to pray yeah. so much. Been, been, been ben Carson. I said disappointed, that's all right. But Ben Carson was, was raised by a single parent woman. And he has turned out to be a very noble person. So I'm not saying that everybody who went down one road ends up that same path. There are exceptions, but Ben is clearly an exception to the process of denying fatherhood. Yeah. Not insisted. When you call a man a baby daddy, that means he's only the daddy of the baby. And he's nothing to you. And he's nothing to family. And a daddy is merely somebody who just got a name. Got a title by default. But a father God didn't call us to be daddies. I know daddy is a term, but I, I, it's nice. Because all, I know my, my brother's got two kids and his daughter adores him. He, tell, he tells me, you will never know the love of a daughter. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> I got two sons, I think they love me pretty much, but I, I can tell there's a difference between the love of a son and the love of a daughter. Brother Harrigan, I can see the difference between the love of a son and the love of a daughter. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Brother and Sister Reed, you got two of each, and I know you know the difference between the love of a son and the love of a daughter. And the sons love you. I know your sons yeah. love you, but it's not the same as the daughter's love. Right. Ooh, so I, I'll, I'll never have the full daughter's love, so that's why I'm always looking for people like Sister Angie to love me more and more. <laughs> Since Sister Jean wouldn't give me a daughter, I had to find my own without the hair guard root. <laughs> Hallelujah. I stayed in the Word. Yes, yes. I didn't have to go look for hair guard, but I still sent me a daughter. 
generation and the next generation and the next generation will, will be generations that love God. That's why the Old Testament, I know, I know it's sexist for, for looking at it through 20, 20 eyes, but let me tell you, it's not sexist. God made men in a certain way that he didn't make women. And he made women in a certain way that he didn't make men. Right. And it's not to make women less than men. Eve was not less than Adam. She was a partner to Adam. God didn't say, this is your maid, now you can do whatever you want to do with her. No, you have to respect her. But God gave Adam the authority to name everything. And the authority to say to Eve, get away from me with that fruit. And therefore God held Adam accountable. God did not come in the cool of the day and said, Eve, where are you? And he didn't say when Adam, because you know Adam got so indignant that he blamed God. Because Adam says, it is the woman that you gave me that caused me to fall from your grace. If you didn't leave me alone and you didn't take that rib and give me this woman, I would never have sinned against you. So it is not really my fault, Lord. When you look at the point fingers, know that there's three or four pointing back at you. So don't be pointing to me and asking me stuff because it's the woman that you gave me that caused me now to fall from your grace. Can you imagine the nerve of Adam to speak to God and accuse God? I mean, I would have to just shut up. He opened his mouth and made it worse. But God's so loving. God says, I wouldn't even listen to that nonsense you're talking. But I'll tell you this, I'm holding you accountable and you're getting out of here. There's a price to pay when you mess with God. There's a price to pay when you don't follow the word. There's a price to pay. And it's not always the ultimate price because God loves us so much. God's grace is so vast and so full. His mercy endures forever. And oh, God is God I love. Yes. Because even though we sin and fall short of his glory, he still came from heaven looking to seek for us, to die for us, to redeem us from the law, so that we now can walk around as the redeemed of the Lord, so that we can live forever. Those of you who know John 3, 16, that's why he came. We're blessed because God's grace is so wonderful. Because when Adam deserved death, God said, I'm not going to kill you. You're not going to live in paradise anymore. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to learn how to hunt. You're going to have to learn how to make clothes. You're going to have to learn a lot of stuff. But I'll be with you to protect you. Yes. I will still be your God. I will still teach you and guide you and bless you. When, when the prodigal souls, we say, son, return home, the father did say, well, you left, and you took all that I had for you, so too bad. The word of God says, from afar off, yes, yes. the father saw him and the father took off yes. toward that son and met that son way down the road and hugged him and kissed him. The son fell on his knees and said, no, you don't deserve to be on your knees. Stand up. He hugged him. He took his robe off and put his robe on him and put a, a, a ring on his finger to signify, you have authority. The father threw a party and said, this is my son which was lost. Thank God for fathers. Yes. And without enumerating them, I'm to the fourth point, believe it or not. In Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us that we should honor our fathers and our mothers. It's the first commandment with a promise is the only commandment with a promise. Because if you go back to, to, to the book of Exodus, it says, honor your father and your mother, and the promise is that your days 
may be long. In other words, so that you will live a long life. A lot of people don't believe the word, but I can tell you, I'm a believer of the word. The reason I honor my physical, natural, biological father and mother is not because they're the greatest parents on earth. It's not because they love me first. It's, not, it's because I am selfish. I want to live long. And God says, if you want to live long, you got to honor your father and your mother. So my reason starts with my service to God. Now, yes, I love my parents. Yes, they've been great to me. Yes, I am beholden to them. But I let, listen, every now and then my father says something to me that is truly nonsense. I'm like, where are you coming from? But I'm going to honor you because not of what you say to me, I'm going to honor you because of what God says to me. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to honor you because I want to live long in the land which the Lord, my God, has given me. So now we get to the word Abba. As I said, it's not just Daddy. Daddy is kind of, kind of making it a little too trivial at times. Even though I understand that we want to move away from this God that's so far out there that we can't reach, so Daddy makes it a lot more personal. We understand that. But this Daddy, this Abba, is, is, is Jesus saying, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Abba, Father. He is saying, the strong and mighty and authority of all. I honor you, and so not my will, Father, but your will be done. I don't know if it's true that Jesus had an option. It would appear that he had an option. I think he would always choose what he knew he had to choose, so the result would have been the same. I don't think Jesus would have come this far, suffered so much, and then say, well, Lord, you know what? I changed my mind. These people aren't really worth it. Uh, I definitely don't want to suffer anymore, so let me come back home and we'll work on another plan. Uh, I don't think that that was ever an option. So I, I don't think Jesus was doing this to, to tell us that he had an option. He was doing it to show us that he loved us so much that when he got down to the point of facing certain death, his humanity was telling him, try to find an alternative way to get out of this. But his divinity says, not my will. Yes, yes. Father, the author. Father, the strong and almighty one. Father, the one whom I adore and respect. Not my will, the son's will, but your will be done. I will go all the way to Calvary. And so Paul in Romans 8 and 15 explains that, that now we are sons of the Almighty. Yes. So, so we are, with this, this, this birth thing that God has given us, this rebirth that we have, makes us not just children of God. That's a little bit too, too distant. Uh, but that's why we can cry to him and say, Abba, Father, because we are sons and daughters of the great Almighty One. We're not just a, another great person. We are sons and daughters of this great God. Yes, yes. And so this Abba is not just Daddy, but this Abba is Father. Creator of heaven and earth, I am your child. We say today, I'm a child of God. Hmm? The songs today reflected that we were children of the Most High God. Who am I? Hmm. Yet you died for me. Yet you are alive for me. Yet you have raised me up. So yet, I will now look to you. 
and call you Abba, Father. I will call you a, a, a strong connection one that I have with you. And then the final scripture I want to quote is in Galatians 4 and 6 again. It says, because we are sons of God, we also have the Spirit of God in us. That's why we can say to you, Father, and I use the word that connects me closer to you than just saying Almighty God or saying Jehovah. Jehovah, Jehovah is a great word, but Jehovah puts you so far away from me that I want to bring you closer to me. Our relationship is, is greater than a God way out there. That's Jehovah, the untouchable one. Jehovah, Elohim, as a matter of fact, we could only say Jehovah because we couldn't say his name before. And so, so that we could say something, we added those vowels because we started saying Yahweh, which is the, the Greek, the, the Hebrew word, but really it's Jehovah, but really we're not even supposed to say his name, he's so great, but we are now sons of this so great God. We are now children of this one that was formerly unspoken of. We couldn't say his name. Now he's not Jehovah, he's not Yahweh. He is Father. Yes. He is Abba. So in English we say he's Abba Father, which is really redundant because Abba is Father. But you understand and God understands that we're saying we're so close. I can feel your very presence. I have a relationship with this great God. And this relationship is one of a father to his children. And so today, we want to honor all fathers. Amen. And you are not a great father if you are not a believer. You might be a great daddy, but you're not a great father unless you are a believer, unless you understand who God is, and unless you can relate that experience to your children. You've got to be God to your children. Not God over your children, because you know sometimes that's what we want. You've got to be the protector and the provider. You've got to be the one whose arms are outstretched that when my children go astray and they come back, I still stand with outstretched hands and I say, come on son, come on daughter. I will love you no matter what. Because my love for you is greater than you could even imagine. We all have fathers. Hopefully you know who they are. But I hope that you have a wonderful relationship with your father. And so today, to children, I want to say, if your relationship to your father, not your heavenly father, your biological father, if it is not a great, wonderful relationship, let today, 2019, Father's Day, be the day that you make it a great relationship. I want you to find your father wherever he is and, and let him know that you love him and if there's something you need to forgive him for, forgive him. And to fathers, if you have a child that you think is okay, that, that you don't know where they are and, and you don't have a relationship with them because they're not speaking to you, because there's a disagreement, I want you to find that child today. When you leave here today, I want you to seek out that child. Let that child know that you are father. That doesn't matter where that child is, how that child is, you are their father. Yes. And you will love them till the end of time. And if you have a great relationship with your father, and fathers, if you have a great relationship with your kids, then even more so today should you rejoice in knowing that you and your kids are experiencing that wonderful father relationship. This is Father's Day. This is a day that we honor you fathers and encourage you to be the men of God that God has called you to be. Encourage you to be the ones who are examples of the believers.
for your children, the ones who will raise them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord, so that in turn they can honor you. It's a cycle. Fathers be fathers, so that children can honor you as their fathers. I hope today that you have heard the word of God. I hope today that something in this word has rung out to you to let you know that this is a day to celebrate. This is a day of rejoicing. This is, this is a time for us to, you know, family is all you have. And I know that's the saying, but it's really true. And it's important, since today is Father's Day, that you celebrate fathers. There's a reason why I've always insisted that my family celebrate Father's Day. I don't wait for them to celebrate for me. I say, hey, it's Father's Day, let's celebrate. I, I tell you, if you wait, you get disappointed. I don't want to be disappointed. It's Father's Day, so I got a, got a nice note from my older son who says, sorry I can't be with you today, but I want to wish you all the best and you've been, and try to put a little joke in there, you've been a above average father, and he says, all jokes aside, you've been a great dad. <laughs> so even if we can't be together, you need to honor me on Father's Day. Praise the Lord. Yes. And I told my other son where I want to go and that he should pay for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. The one who stays home is the one who gets to pay. <laughs> hey. But it's Father's Day. Being a godly man amen, amen. and being a great father.